We've done some computations for our piping system with a TACO TA series model 1548 pump. And we were looking at an initial design that had six inch piping involved. Now we can do a lot of stuff in the computer, but usually it's easier to just work directly on a printed copy of the manufacturer's pump data sheet. So an awful lot of information is already here in a very concise format for the manufacturer. But to do that, we have to actually transfer our system curves onto this with a pencil and paper. So for the six inch pipe, I was able to take four data points like this and plot them for the system curve. And that covers the whole range of interest. Yeah, it's a parabola that goes right down to zero flow. But the region that I'm interested in is in here somewhere. So there's our six inch pipe solution. And it goes through this operating point for the 16.3 inch impeller that was the suggestion from the selection system. So that's, that's encouraging. It's doing about the right thing. We could maybe pick the 16 inch impeller, an off the shelf part. We'd get a little bit lower than our design flow rate, but that might work out okay. Another option that we thought about was maybe increasing the pipe size to eight inches. And here's four points that I took from the system curve for the eight inch pipe case. And I can, con can connect those in a curve that looks somewhat like a parabola and covers the range of interest. So now we're trying to pick between two different design conditions. One is the six inch pipe where just about half of the energy we were putting in was going into friction losses in the pipe. And the other, this eight inch pipe where it's a much smaller fraction of the energy that's being thrown away. So I like the eight inch pipe solution. And that tells me I could probably move down to the smallest impeller size and still get fairly good performance. I'd still be delivering more than the design flow rate if I just got the 14.17 inch impeller and, uh, and installed it. So that might be a nice point to operate. It's a little oversized. It's going to give us a little more flow than we need, but we can always, uh, always bring that back down. I can always close the valve off and move up to here at that flow. Or if I go further, I can move further up this line to anywhere along this line for reduced flow cases without dramatically increasing the amount of uh, energy I'm using to make it useful. So the answer is, Almost never would we just let it run and let it pour down the sewer. That would be a, a foolish case. Turning it on and off, if we had to switch it on and switch it off and switch it on and switch it off, that transient loading is going to cause some uh, uh, maintenance issues with our switch gear, perhaps. Whereas if we can just throttle the valve down a little bit, then we can keep the pump running and reduce the load. Now let's look at the consequences. In both of these cases, either the uh, six inch pipe or the eight inch pipe case, we look up here and we see an NPSH of under 10. The number that it quoted us for this design point was nine feet of NPSH. So let's hang on to that and we'll check up on that later and find out if we're okay. If we went up to higher pump speeds, we'd be going to a much higher NPSH and we might have to do something to avoid cavitation. But we'll check, we'll check this with our MPSH uh, requirement of nine. Now, if we went with the uh, six inch pipe case up here, we could also throttle back and operate at any of those points along that pump curve. We'd be reducing the, the flow rate while increasing the head somewhat. And of course, we're seeing a decline in efficiency. So we'd have to evaluate the characteristics for each of those operating points as well. The bottom line is going to come from evaluating the dollar cost of the energy that we have to put in to make this system operate. But usually we will wind up just reducing the flow rate by reducing the, uh, the area in the valve. If we had a much larger system, of course, instead of having just one of these pumps, we might put two or three of them in parallel, allowing us to go down to, say, two-thirds load, and then we would just switch one off and go right back up to our regular design point. So that's the approach we take in terms of picking pumps and piping and considering our options. And now that we've decided to go with the eight inch pipe and the 14.17 inch impeller, we need to decide on what motor we're gonna put on it. Now our expected operating point here 
has a motor horsepower requirement just a little bit under 100 horsepower. And as long as we stayed below this line, we'd be fine. But if we ever use this pump at a higher flow rate, we're going to require more than 100 brake horsepower to drive the pump. So if we want to be safe, we're going to actually order it with a 125 horsepower motor. It's not going to add an awful lot of cost to the installation, but it means that if we've overestimated the losses in our 8-inch pipe, that for just a little increase in the potential horsepower of the motor, we've gained a lot of capacity in here. Let's look back at the diagram for our practical system. Here's our pump. We've already put it a little bit of a distance below the surface of the water to improve the NPSH system. We've reduced the losses in our piping system by going to 8 inch pipe instead of 6 inch pipe and that seems to make sense for us. And we've got a distance LS for the pipe getting into the suction side of the pump and a gate valve on this suction side of the pump as well as this re-entrant entry. So if we want to figure out the NPSH here and make sure we're not going to have a cavitation problem, then we're going to have to look at the difference between the NPSH that we have available, that is what the pressure actually is here, and the NPSH that the pump requires here, what the pressure uh, must be in order to avoid cavitation. So here's our uh, pump diagram where we looked at our, our different options and we were going to operate either in this range on the 6 inch pipe uh, design but we decided to go with the 8 inch so we're operating in this range which is still about the same flow rate and still has an NPSH of 9 feet so a fairly low requirement uh, to avoid cavitation it could go much higher say around 35 if we're going to really high flow rates and velocities so if our NPSH required is 9 feet or 2.8 meters of head, then we can calculate the NPSH available and see if we make it. So we need to know the atmospheric pressure and the vapor pressure. Well, PATM, we could just choose one standard atmosphere if we knew we were only going to be operating at sea level and on days when the weather was nice. But we'll have to take into account the fact that we in, even in Kingston are a little bit above sea level and sometimes the pressure drops below uh, standard atmospheric pressure. So our atmospheric pressure that we will design for will be say 96 kilopascals or 96,000 pascals. Our vapor pressure, well the vapor pressure is 4246 I get from my tables for water at 30 degrees C. So we could imagine the water might conceivably be reasonably warm coming in from the lake. It certainly gets warmer than 20 degrees, so we'll, we'll plan for a vapor pressure that could be as high as the vapor pressure at 30 C. Still, there's a big gap between 96,000 and 4,000, so we should be doing okay. Our HS, well, let's suppose that we've managed to put our pump one meter below the lake level and see where we get to. The length of the suction line might be 20 meters and the sum of the K values for minor losses in the suction is going to be the reentrant entry and one gate valve so it's a number around one. So considerably uh, smaller than the total amount of friction losses in the pipe will be the part that happens just upstream of the suction. So if we look at the different terms that we've got here, the P atmosphere minus P vapor, the difference between those two divided by rho G for water, gives us a value of about 9.37 meters of NPSH available with just the pressure taken into account. We're actually increasing that by one because of the system head available. And then we have to take into account the fact that we're going to drop by v squared over 2g. And the velocity is fairly low, so the v squared over 2g is going to wind up being around 0.2. And then when we take into account our friction losses for the friction factor and just the length in the suction side of the piping divided by d, and this is going to be lower losses because we've now gone up to the 8-inch pipe, 
and we've only got these K factors contributing to losses here, uh, this amount will wind up being about 0 0.5. And we'll wind up with a net NPSH available equal to 9.37, 10.37, minus 0.2 takes us down to 10.17, minus 0.5 takes us down to 9.67 meters. So with 9.67 meters of NPSH available, we're much, much greater, well, significantly greater than the 2.8 meters that we require. Let's, let's soften that a little bit. I'll just put a faded, much, much greater sign there. So we could afford to uh, move the pump up a little bit. For instance, we could raise our pump above the water level. That has all sorts of practical advantages. We don't have to dig a basement that goes below the level of the lake that is inevitably going to flood with water. We can put our pump above the lake level. So we've got a spare hmm, almost seven meters there. So we could take HS from plus one meter, so a meter below the lake level, to being, uh, say, minus three. We could be three meters above lake level, well up onto the shore, and that would be good from a practical design standpoint. So doing this NPSH calculation allows us to find out just how much space we have left in, able to, uh, in, in order to enable us to avoid cavitation and allows us to make some practical design decisions to make sure that we're avoiding cavitation at the same time as having a, uh, an operational configuration that we can, uh, we can live with.